us in prayer. Father Almighty, as we come to look at your word and gather under it, pray that you might open our hearts and minds up um, to the great truths contained within. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Seven trumpets and three spiritual realities from Revelation 8 and 9. Uh, in 1937, there was a civil war. It erupted in Spain between the Republicans and the Nationalists. And at that time, the Nationalist uh, government asked the German National Socialist government, the Nazis, to help them. What did German, Germany do? They did a three-hour bombing raid on the city of Guernica. They nearly annihilated the city and they killed or wounded one-third of the population. In response, Pablo Picasso did one of his most famous works, Guernica, the name of the city. Uh, the painting measures about 3.5 metres by 8 metres. When you see it, it's supposed to overwhelm you. Can you see those awful images on there? A baby slain, an arm severed, um, tears, a spear through a horse, animals looking like a distorted... It's, it's an awful, awful picture. The Seven Trumpets, I think, in some senses, are really about this awful picture, <laughs> this awful reality. See, Revelation is a picture, uh, a vision of God's perspective on earth. It's the, it's the spiritual reality of human life. It's the spiritual reality of how God sees what is unfolding among us. Well, how do we understand events like this in the past or equally horrific ones among us? And, and what, what would Jesus do about it? What, what's going on? How should we understand that? Now, it might be hard for us if you're uh, in the comfort of the West, but for him, Perhaps having lived for a global pandemic, I don't know if you remember just, you know, a couple of years ago, watching the thing that struck me most was in one of the most powerful and prosperous cities of the world, the city of New York and Manhattan Island, that they had to get um, containers, refrigeration containers to put the bodies. And they had to set up mass graves on some of the nearby islands because the city was overwhelmed with the number of dead. Awful and great evil happen in the world. How should we think about these things? Well, we're thinking about seven trumpets. Uh, the structure of, of uh, the next section of Revelation is really from 8 to chapter 11. You hear four trumpets, which we didn't hear read to us in chapter 8. The fifth and sixth trumpet sound in chapter 9. Then there's an interlude chapters 11 and 12, and right at the end of chapter 11 is the seventh trumpet. So if you want to kind of read this as kind of a, a unit of the book of Revelation, it's chapters 8 through to 11. Well, what are the first four trumpets about? They are unnatural disasters. They are natural disasters, but they are unnatural disasters. Pick up with me at eight, chap, uh, chapter 8, verse 1. When he opened the seventh seal, so picking up on the continuation, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Then I saw the seven angels who stand in the presence of God. Seven trumpets were given to them. And another angel with a golden incense burner came and stood at the altar. He was given a large amount of incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar in front of the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints went up into the presence of God from the angel's hand. And the angel took the incense burner, filled it with fire from the altar, and hurled it to the earth. There were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashings of lightning, and an earthquake. And the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. And the first angel blew his trumpet, and hail and fire mixed with blood were hurled to the earth. Powerful picture. What's going on? Well, the prayers of God's people are taken with incense and offered up. 
the prayers I take it from the martyrs in the earlier chapter, or maybe the prayers of all God's people, but it just says the prayers of all God's people, are offered up before God, and in response, fire from the altar, it's symbolic, is, is hurled to the earth. And along with that, you notice how the, the angel blows his trumpet, and as he blows his trumpet, verse 2, hail and fire mixed with blood were hurled to the earth. That language of hurling, it's what the angel had and hurled down. And there were peals of thunder and rumbles and flashes of lightning, but not on the throne, but on the earth. <laughs> it's God's, the image is God's will happening on earth. Um, how to think about these four trumpets, um, it, it's full of kind of powerful and evocative imagery. Uh, most of it comes from the book of Exodus. Most of it, but not completely. Some of it comes from the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah. Some of it comes from the passages in the Old Testament where, about the fall of Babylon and how God will bring Babylon down after the way she's killed so many people and crushed so many nations. And it, it's these images. And, and it's, it's again, it's, if you look too closely... It's actually, it's hard to work out what's going on. You're not supposed to look, it's more like, an, remember, it's like an impressionistic painting. The power is not found by looking really close at the picture, but by stepping back and feeling the sweep of it. And you'll notice in, in the language here, as each angel blows their trumpet, verse 7, verse 8, verse 10, verse 12, the repetition goes something like this. A third of the green trees were destroyed. All the green stuff was gone. And what was hurled down was hail mixed with fire and blood. Hail recalls the Exodus plagues when God rescued his people out of Egypt. But why blood? Well, to symbolize all the lives that have been taken on the earth. You know, life was taken, symbolic of the lives taken by humanity against each other. Hail mixed with blood is hurled down. The second trumpet sounds, and a great mountain is hurled into the sea, and one, uh, one third of the ocean becomes like a place of death. Again, echoes of Exodus, but kind of greater. The third trumpet sounds, and a great star falls from heaven, and a, a third of the fresh water is made bitter. What's the great star about? The city of Babylon in Isaiah 14. God says, when the city of Babylon comes down, the prince is like a great star, but a star fallen, fallen, fallen to the earth. See, it's all recalling past judgments in the Old Testament. And what will happen? Well, there's wormwood, which actually recalls God's judgment on his own people when they rebelled against him and he made their water bitter. And they, they suffered and some died. And the fourth trumpet... Well, the lights of the sky, sun and moon and stars, which are all given in the book of Genesis for people to live. Well, a third of the night now is without day and a third of the night is without light. It's a pretty scary image, isn't it? Because at night, at least you've got the moon. And if there's no moon, at least you've got the stars. But even the stars have gone. It's hinting the judgment is so bad, it's almost like the unmaking of creation. That's when you, you know when you hear this kind of language of that the sky is darkened and the sun is blotted out. It's it's to remind you of God's creative power and His goodness to all people, but the judgment is so bad that it's like the world is almost being unmade. That's the sense and that's the feeling. And it's all warnings that come by trumpets. So a third, it's a significant proportion. <laughs> that's how that number works. Just a significant proportion. It's not everywhere. It's not everything. Now, again, symbolism. If you do the math, so you go, well, it's a third of the green stuff. Well, actually, all the, all the grass, but a third of the tree. It doesn't work. <laughs> How can it be a third of the ocean? Was that just the Pacific? It wasn't the Atlantic. Oh, it was the Mediterranean Sea, but not. No, it, don't, don't do that. Uh, it, it, it's a significant proportion. That's all it's really saying. But it's an escalation. In the seven seals, it was a quarter. Now it's a third. See, uh, scholar Tim Chester comments that around 70 AD, if you remember this was written around 90 AD, that Mount Vesuvius had erupted and destroyed the city of Pomp 
Pompeii. And for years, across the Mediterranean, the sky was darkened and light took on that blood red character. So it's echoed in the creation. Well, you, you want to ask, well, what's, what's going on? Well, it's pretty easy to go pretty crazy, right? Uh, with this kind of powerful imagery. But if you remember, this is written for Christians now, but it's also written for the Christians in the first century under the rule of the Roman Empire. What was John trying to tell them? Well, he was trying to tell them with these images like the fall of Babylon and Sodom and Gomorrah and the judgment on Egypt that God will bring judgment on his enemies. That you might fear the power of Rome and Rome might look unstoppable and they might look like they control the power of life and death because of the volumes, the leaders upon leaders of blood they've shed across the world. But God will bring judgment upon them. See, the 10 sets of disasters in Egypt, the echoes of Egypt there, happened. Why? Why did that happen to Egypt in the book of Exodus? Well, because Egypt worshipped creation and they worshipped idols and they worshipped Pharaoh and his power like a god and God showed to them, you are not gods. Pharaoh's not God. He cannot control creation. And because of all the death and slavery you've brought, what will happen to you? Well, justice, death, and the blood that you've shed will be revealed to you. So that ancient picture of judgment is kind of carried forward into this vision and is a, a source of great encouragement to the Christians. And I'll talk about that a bit more. See, natural disasters the Bible is saying, are actually unnatural disasters. This is a vision of God's judgment coming on the Roman Empire. These disasters are God's judgment. It's his warning to the Roman Empire. Your Caesars are not gods. If they were gods, wouldn't they be able to stop this and protect their people? Your gods are not gods. Wouldn't they be able to hold back the flood and the fire? Well, how should we respond well, I think we often in the modern world are a bit shocked by this because uh, it's, it's a judgment and it's a warning. It's a judgment on those who die, but it's a warning to all the living. That's why it's not everyone. It's just a partial judgment, but it's a warning. But that's a bit shocking, isn't it? That God would use the death of people to warn other people. But that's because we think death is the greatest disaster. Because this, that's the horizon of the Western world. We've ruled out that there's anything greater than us, that there is no spiritual realm, that there is no God, at least most of the West has. And so that all that matters is this one short life that we have of 10, 20, 30, 40 years, just short decades. And so a life cut short is a disaster. A life ended by an accident is a disaster. And, and it is, in a sense, isn't it? We know throughout the Bible, the Bible says every death is a disaster. Every death is not meant to be. And you know we've felt that as a family. We've felt the weight of death and disaster this year. And you felt it with us. But in the framework of the Bible and measured against eternity and measured against the judgment of God, death is not the great disaster. Everyone will die. The question is, where will you stand before God when you meet your maker? And so in a sense, God uses severe mercy. He brings death and judgment upon the world and it is a great disaster but it's to warn people of a greater disaster. Where do you stand before the living God who made the cosmos? How will you answer him for the evil that you've done? So how should we respond? Well, yes, 
unnatural disasters are a great tragedy. And we should do all that we can to alleviate them. Especially Christians, we should be at the forefront of loving and caring for people. Even as God's judgment fall, it's an opportunity for love. And we have to be careful. We don't know why this group of people, <laughs> it's just because disaster happens to them. It might not actually be the judgment on them. It might just be it's the warning to the rest of the world and it's their time has come. Not that they were more evil than others. But we have to stop and reflect, isn't it? See, if every disaster brings death, well, death is a bell that tolls for all of us, isn't it? We will all die. Why? Because we all deserve to face God. And so every death and disaster should warn us, should make us reflect and take stock of where we stand before God. We will not live forever. Death is a disaster that may come upon us soon. Are you ready? Sounds serious, but it gets worse. Yeah, it's probably one of the hardest things to preach, I reckon, this section. Romans, uh, sorry, Revelation 8, 13. Oh, if only we were in Romans. Next year we're planning to do Romans and you'll be like, oh, thank goodness, such an easy book. 8, 13. I looked, a reminder that it's a vision and symbolic. I looked and heard an eagle flying high overhead, crying out in a loud voice, woe, 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 woe to those who live on the earth because of the remaining trumpet blasts that the three angels are about to sound. And so you have the fifth and sixth trumpets, which I think are military conquest, kind of. <laughs> the fifth and sixth trumpets are military conquests, kind of. So what happens? Well, 9-1, the fifth angel blew his trumpet and I saw a star that had fallen from heaven to earth. Is that the star from earlier? Possibly. And what happens is the key for the shaft to the abyss, the underworld, is given to him. And he opened up the shaft to the abyss and smoke came out of the shaft like smoke from a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke from the shaft. And then locusts came out of the smoke to the earth. And power was given to them like the power of scorpions have on the earth. And they were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant or any tree but only those people who do not have God's seal on their foreheads. They were not permitted to kill them, but were to torment them for five months. And their torment is like the torment caused by a scorpion when it stings someone. In those days, people will seek death and not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. What an awful, awful picture. What's happening here? Well, in the Old Testament, um, the locusts were a sign of plague and judgment from God. But weird things happen in the kind of apocalyptic literature. In Jeremiah and in Joel, it talks about great plagues of locusts coming, and they're a form of judgment upon God's people. But when you read the text, in Joel especially, it's really hard to work out, is it actually great big grasshoppers? Or is it an army of men? And in fact, it sounds like it in Joel 2 verse 2. Like the blackness there is spread upon the mountains, a great and powerful people. Their like has never been seen before, will ever be seen again through the years of all generations. And this army comes. And at the end of Joel, it's only four chapters long, in the fourth chapter, it's all about the judgment God will call upon the nations. It's not the locusts who get judged, but the nations because of their wars. So what's going on? Well, this imagery of a, of, of, a, of a great plague of locusts that are unstoppable is kind of like layered over the picture of a great army. What happens, I think, when an army sweeps through the land? They eat everything. They take everything. They've come to kill and to conquer and they burn the ground and they destroy life and people. And so I think in Joel, actually, it's about the Babylonians coming, or perhaps another army. And they just come like a plague. There's so many of them. They just swarm across the earth. And so all the nations will be judged. And so then this imagery 
from Exodus and Joel and Jeremiah is picked up into the book of Revelation. And it's saying great armies will sweep across the earth. What will they be like? Like demonic locusts. Their power will be so great and so terrible. Now, some people, because these armies come out of the abyss, say, no, no, this is actually about a demonic kind of military might. And on the sixth trumpet, um, towards the end, actually plagues come forth from the horse-like scorpions. So it's hard to work out. Um, and it's kind of, is it the same army in the sixth trumpet or something different? They're kind of the similar to the fifth one, but, but a little bit different. But I just want to point out to you a couple of things in the fifth trumpet. See, in the fifth one, God's people are protected. A little bit like in the seventh seals. And, and the earth is protected. But people suffer. And it's, it's a terrible picture. They long for death. But death flees from them. What's going on with that? In the sixth trumpet, because each time you hit six, in this, it's, it seems it's like the final judgment. It's hard to work out. Sometimes the seventh is the, the, the final judgment. Sometimes it's the sixth. But in the sixth one, the judgment is worse. You notice now that even God's people die. It just says a third of all people die. Verse 18, a third of the human race was killed by these three plagues coming out of the scorpion horses, by the fire and smoke and sulfur that came from their mouths and the power of the horses in their mouths and in their tails because of their tails, which remember, resemble snakes that have heads which inflict injury. Again, it, it, don't try and draw it. But when you see these images, it's supposed to evoke in you a sense of fear, of the awfulness of the judgment to come. Military conquests, mighty armies, and potentially plague and disease that come along with that. What happens when one group of people swarms across a continent and bring with them uh, and, and go into another place in another country in another continent? What do they bring with them? all the illnesses and their diseases, which cause just as much death as most of the military conquest. That's part of the history of the world. Whew. What do we do with this? Three spiritual realities. One, come with me back to 8 verse 3. Prayers are never wasted. Another angel with a golden incense burner came and stood at the altar. He was given the large amount of incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar. Every prayer that was uttered, weak, trembling prayers made with just, just a mustard seed of faith, bold, fearsome prayers. Prayers made where you hardly know the words to pray because it's so hard. Prayers of triumph and confidence because you know the goodness and the character of God and you've seen his blessing. Prayers uttered in the bright morning at the beauty of the day and prayers uttered at 2 a.m. when all is bleak. Every prayer is heard by God. That's what that picture is. And actually, out of the answer of his prayers, in this case, judgment falls. And also salvation in chapter 10 and 11. Every prayer matters to God. Your prayers are not wasted. God on his throne hears your prayers. What ought to mark us if we call God our Father? Prayer. Don't think just because nothing's happened now. Don't think just because there wasn't an answer given now. Just because the thing you prayed for didn't turn out that God was not listening. This is every prayer made by his people is heard by our heavenly father. And notice where they are. They're in the heavenly temple. Every prayer is treasured and heard. And God is at work in them. 
That's the picture. The judgment flows in response to the prayers. Your prayers are powerful. They are not wasted. What's the second reality? Satan is at work. I think that some people say these are demonic, in the, in the Trumpets 5 and 6, these are demonic forces that rise up out of the abyss. And others say, no, no, it's just military, it's earthly armies, it's kind of like the seven seals and the four horsemen. I think actually it's supposed to be both laid over the top of each other. What are, what are men doing? Rising up in armies and military conquests. But who is Satan? Well, he's the father of lies, but Jesus also names him the murderer who wants to take life and wants people to enter into judgment. And so I think that you're seeing both things kind of layered over the top of each other. The further you get through Revelation, the more is revealed in a sense about Satan's role. In the coming chapters, as, as um, Harry kind of gave us a great preview, Satan is the great dragon who calls forward beasts out of the sea. You kind of get, you zoom in on Satan and his work more and more as you get further and further through Revelation. And we're taking a step in that direction. So two things are layered over together, I think. Why is it that armies rise up and cause death and destruction? Well, because of the human heart and because of Satan and his power and his influence. Satan is at work. Spiritual warfare is real and true. And if we, hold, if we, if we grasp onto that, that's really important for how we respond when persecution and suffering and hardship come. Because if we think it's all just kind of earthly, we might respond in an earthly way. We might take up arms to defend ourselves. We might hate the people who act against us. But if we recognize it's a spiritual warfare, we will respond spiritually. And what's the response in spiritual warfare? Well, Ephesians 6 names it. It's to put on the armor of God. What is the armor of God? The gospel. In all its beauty and wonder. It's to lean deeper into the great news of Jesus' death for you and his salvation. It's gospel proclamation. That's your armor and that's your weapons. And it's gospel prayer. He says this, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. Satan is at work. But remember, the other thing to say about Satan, he's a dog on a leash. Notice, he has to be given a key to the abyss. Who has the key to death and Hades? Someone tell me, who has the key to death and Hades in the book of Revelation? Jesus, the slain lamb, has the key to death and Hades. Satan's power is limited. He can only do what Jesus allows him to do. He leads an army, but in the fifth trumpet, he can't hurt God's people according to the seal. The lamb protects them. Yep, Satan, you can have your army, but God's people will be protected. Under the sixth trumpet, things will change. And Jesus will call his people home. Only in the sixth trumpet is he given permission to bring death. He's a dog on a leash. He has power, but it's so very limited. So it's important to hold those things together. Here's the third spiritual reality. God's goal, even in the awfulness of all this, is repentance. See, what are, when do trumpets sound? Trumpets sound, don't they? Uh, they're sounds of warning. Be ready. Look out danger. But there's another way to hear trumpets, isn't there? If you are a small group of Christians, isolated, vulnerable, under attack, and it feels like the culture and the empire is trying to crush you, and then you hear the trumpet call of the army that's on your side. That trumpet call has two edges, doesn't it? To your enemies, it is warning. To you, it is the trumpet of salvation. And it works both ways here. 
Think of the trumpets that call in the book of Joshua, the great kind of, the fall of Jericho. They were trumpets declaring God's power and his greatness and his salvation for his people, but also judgment on those who oppose God. So there's these trumpet sound, they are warnings to the world. And what is God saying? Turn back to me. Turn back to me. Repentance. Change your mind about me. C.S. Lewis, the author, brilliantly captures this. God whispers to us in our pleasures. Turn to me. He speaks in our conscience but he shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. I think that's why, I think that's why in the fifth trumpet, it says people long to die, but death flees from it. It's actually part of God's mercy because once they die, they have to meet God in judgment. And he's using this hardship so that they might turn to him. Perhaps you're here and you're not a Christian. Welcome. If you can get through this talk, you can get through any talk in any church, hands down. You've made it. You've hit the kind of the hardest talk you'll probably ever hear. Welcome. I'm sorry. If you're not a Christian, you might be thinking, ah, oh, I think God matters. Maybe you're persuaded he exists. Perhaps you're thinking, though, I'll turn to God later. I want to say to you, don't wait now is the time to turn to God. The, the warning in the scriptures is that our hearts can harden in a direction and they can set in stone and that we just keep choosing the thing we started to choose spiritually and even when we don't realize it. And that's what Satan loves. And what will happen then? Well, even when God is shouting at you, you will block your ears. Revelation 9.20 says, The rest of the people who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands to stop worshipping demons and idols of gold and silver, bronze, stone and wood, which cannot see, hear or walk. And they did not repent of their murders and their sorceries and their sexual immorality or their thefts. And you notice then how it layers the earthly and the demonic over the top of each other. You made these idols to worship them, but actually it is the worship of demons, even though those idols are nothing. Why? Because they are leading you away from the one you should worship, the slain lamb. But that's not what God wants. It's not what God longs for. To Peter the Lord does not delay his promise, as some understand delay. Some Christians were thinking, when will God fix all the problems? And Peter's saying, God doesn't delay, as some understand delay, because he couldn't be bothered, or his schedule got too busy, or he changed his mind. He's saying, no, that's not why God hasn't brought his great final judgment. Why not? He is patient with you. He's not wanting anyone to perish, but to come to repentance. God is warning the world. There is a judgment to come. Won't you turn back to me? Well, if you're not a Christian and you're persuaded of the gospel and you understand Jesus' life and death given for you, then how do you do that? How do you turn back? You speak to God and you say to him, I'm sorry that I have lived against you and I have ignored you. Please forgive me and accept me because of Jesus. And that is a prayer that God will hear. And then say, change me. I've changed my mind about you, God. And I want you to rule my life. I want you to be number one. So now change me. And he will. What about for those of us who are Christians, though? Well, if we believe these spiritual realities, that prayer is never wasted and heard. That Satan is at work, but God is calling the world to repent. If we believe those spiritual realities, we must be people of deep prayer, mustn't we? We must be people who are urgent in prayer. 
for the lost and those we love and for our city and for the campus. Prayer must be the first thing on our lips. It's, it must start to shape our lives. It must be the bread and butter of our spiritual lives. Let me conclude very quickly. I showed you the picture of Guernica at the start. We've got four things all kind of coming together in this complex few chapters. You've got the wickedness of the human heart that sadly does deserve judgment. And if you don't think it does, then you clearly have not lived long enough. Because if you've lived the long enough, you know there's profound wickedness in the human heart. You've got the second thing, though, that you've got God, fathers, and Jesus' judgment on humanity for this. Because God hates evil, he will judge it. You've got third, you've got Satan at work, bringing about his evil schemes. But God's goal in the midst of this kind of complexity of the spiritual realities unfolding in our lives is that he wants us to turn to him. Will you not do that if you don't yet know him? Let me pray briefly for us and then I'll open up for questions and comments. Father Almighty, such a hard passage to read with such awful truths and in such jarring contrast to this beautiful spring morning in the safety and security of Brisbane. And yet, Father, we thank you for this warning of the way that the world is for many people and the way life is. And Father, that you care and that you are in control and you are calling people home. Father, amongst us at Risen, we ask that you might grow us in prayer for our lost and dying world, knowing that a great day of disaster and death is coming. Amen.